Well, good morning, Journey. Great to have you here this morning. Hey, a round of applause for our team. They do a great job week in and week out, don't they? Up here. Man, we're very grateful uh, for them. And one of the guys was praying before the service. We have a little meeting up here and we pray for the service uh, uh, before you guys ever come in. And he was just praying and thanking God that uh, David and the team put so much effort in each each week, and they do. They they have a lot of songs to learn. A lot goes into this thing, and so uh, we're very very grateful for them. And make sure you express that to them often, uh, because it's easy to forget. That's for sure. Well, my son Caleb turned 21 this year. Can you believe I have a 21 year old? I have like a legal adult, like like a full fledged. I could sit down and have a drink with him, kind of a kid. Like how is that? How is that possible? And it made me start to remember when I turned 21. Do you guys remember when you turned 21? Some of you, it's a long time ago, you know, others not so long ago. But I was thinking about it, man, that was a great year for me. Uh, Because just like Carlisle had his anniversary, uh, my wife and I had um, our anniversary here recently. And I was thinking 21 was how old I was when when I got married. I mean, I was uh, still kind of a kid, but uh, legally adult. and, And I became... Um, uh, married, Chrissy was 20. She couldn't even celebrate, you know, with uh, champagne at our own uh, ceremony. But man, it was uh, it was a great year. Lots to celebrate that year. Not only getting married, uh, but of course the other things that come along uh, with being 21. And so that was, you know, a great year. Then I started thinking about this year. I turned 45 this year. There is not much to celebrate about turning 45. Sure, I get to get up a little bit more. Um, I get to get up a little bit more at night. You know, like that's something to celebrate, I guess. You know, I'm, I'm up in the bathroom more than ever before. Yay me, that's good for me. Yeah, that's, uh, that's exciting. That's great. And uh, I get my 40 plus year old checkup again this year, so that's uh, good for me. Isn't that exciting, guys? Don't you love that part of being a little older? I know you women are like, yeah, welcome to our world. But, you know, that is like not something that any of you should ever look forward to. And it's something that I don't really look forward to. And I'm not a doctor, but I'm pretty sure they don't look forward to it either. That's not like, oh, I can't wait to get into medicine so that I can give those those kind of checkups. Um, Nobody likes them. Nobody likes them. So why do you do it? Well, the reason why I go through with those things and overcome my fear is because I love my wife and my kids and I want to be around with them for a long time, right? And so if there's something that I can do uh, to prolong that and if there's something that I can do to help make sure that I'm staying healthy as long as I can, then I want to do that because I love and care for them. Well, today, here's the transition. This, I promise this all makes sense on some level here. <laughs> In similar fashion, uh, let's admit, nobody ever goes to bed on Saturday night, leans over towards their spouse and gives them a kiss on the cheek and says, you know what? I hope tomorrow the pastor talks about money. (laughs) It's very similar to going to the doctor, right? I mean, like, nobody does that. Nobody's like super jazzed when the preacher is going to be talking about money. And guess what? The preachers don't always get excited about it either. So why do we do it? Why do we talk about money when we're in church? And here's why. Because if I want to live a a healthy spiritual life into the future, if I want to have a successful life, then I need to follow God's ways when it comes to the resources that he has given me. And so today, uh, we're not going to shy away from it. We're going to go right after it. And we're going to look at what Jesus has to say about money. And we're going to look that Jesus tells us that in regards to our money, tomorrow matters. Tomorrow matters. You got your Bible? Open it up. Turn to the Gospel of Luke. Uh, go to chapter 16. Uh, 1 through 15 is where we're going to be focusing our attention. And we're going to kind of work our way through this passage. It's a unique passage. Uh, one that I've never spoken on in the 20 plus years of ministry that I've been doing. And so uh, this is a, a first for me. Maybe a first for you listening to it as well. Uh, something on this passage. But it's a great one nonetheless. And we're going to look at how Jesus tells us that money in regards to our money, uh, tomorrow matters. So this is a passage about this shrewd manager. Here we go. Words are on the screen if you want to follow along. There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot manage any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? 
My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm too ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called each of his master's debtors. And he asked the first, how much money do you owe the master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. I don't know what that guy was doing, 900 gallons of olive oil, but that's what he owed. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 450. Then he asked the second, how much money do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He said, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is all gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if I have not been trustworthy in someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who loved money heard all of this, and they were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. Hey, uh, I want to pray for us. God, um, I know it can be uncomfortable when we talk about money, and not only money in general, money when we're just talking with friends, or money when we're uh, talking with our spouse, but it's also uncomfortable, God, at times when we talk about money in church. But God, I know that you have our best interests in mind, and so I pray that you would help us understand what it is you want us to hear today. And uh, God, you would lower our defenses, you would get through to our our hearts, and then you would transform our actions as we walk out of here today. Uh, Please, for your glory and for our good and for the good of the world, would you do this in Jesus' name? Amen. Okay, so uh, this passage is one, as I've mentioned, that I've never taught on, and it's because it's a little odd, don't you think? I mean, there's some oddity to it. It seems at face value when you read it that what Jesus is trying to tell us to do is for us to buy friends. Isn't that kind of what it seems like he is? And listen, I'm not opposed to that. I'm not opposed to people buying my friendship. If you want to do that, I put together a little price list. We got it up here on the screen so that you can kind of see uh, how much, you know, my, my friendship with you would cost. You know, certain things require a little bit more. Some things, you know, only a dollar. Listening to... You complain about Johnny is only a buck, but other things, you know, cost a, a little bit more. So just keep this in mind. I'm not opposed to you interpreting the Bible in that fashion, if you would like to go down the road. But as I look at it, it doesn't seem to me that this is the way that Jesus wants us to see it. It doesn't seem to me that Jesus is trying to get us to, uh, trying to convince us that if we really want to have a successful life, that we should buy friends, that that's not what he is getting at. And that's really contrary to the kind of character that Jesus has and outside of his other scope of teaching. And so we're going to kind of leave that aside. But with that in mind, I'd like to walk through the passage and hopefully gain a little bit of clarity as to what Jesus is really saying and try to bring some of the first century nuances here into our day and age uh, and try to get some understanding based on that. So let's look at the different characters of this passage, shall we? We're just going to walk through the two main characters and there's also another character that's outside of the actual story that is included in this passage that we're going to look at as well. So first off, there's the master. What do we know about this master? Well, from different cues from the text, we actually can learn a lot if we kind of jot them all down and and just really look at what Jesus says about this master. What do we know about him? Well, he must have been in the produce business on some level, uh, most likely owned a farm with multiple crops on it, uh, included olives that he made olive oil from, and it also included wheat. This was part of this master's reign or regime or this if we just want to put it in our way, this guy was a big time farmer. He had a lot of land, uh, so much so that we know that he was successful and he had enough, enough land and enough business that he had to hire managers to be able to run the farm that he was running. And he put these different people in charge of most likely selling and then collecting um, on the debts that he would um, have based on his large farming business. 
Uh, something caused this owner to examine closely his employees' books. Perhaps it was what historian Josephus wrote about during this era. There was a large drop in sales of wheat due to an increase of gluten allergies in the first century, and so <laughs> maybe that's what was going on. Whatever the case, upon inspection uh, at this point, he realizes that one of his servants, one of, as we would say, employees, uh, was doing something that was dishonest and he called this guy in like all good leaders do he called this guy in and went straight at it and said you got to give an account for what you are doing here and this is where we run into the next character the servant uh, the servant is what we would call an employee uh, somehow he's involved in sales and there's some type of collection side uh, to that. He was most likely, uh, according to custom in the first century, and this is something that I think would help you understand the text better, um, he was most likely paid by commission. And so somewhat like a tax collector in the first century, one of these managers would be responsible for going and selling and then receiving back uh, a certain amount of money for the crops that he was giving away on behalf of the owner of the land. And what he would do is he would get a percentage of the sales. What some people did, and this is what I think this uh, servant here did, is that they would overcharge. So let's say the master said, you know what, go out and sell these for 500 bucks. He would go out and sell them for 750. He'd make his commission on the 500, plus he would pocket the extra $250 and he would be making more and more money and he'd be taking advantage of people and uh, getting them into greater and greater debt, but he himself would profit from this. Well, this unfaithful practice or this dishonest practice was brought to the attention uh, of the master and so he was called in and he knew he was in trouble. He didn't have a Sharpie in a cardboard box, and so he knew that he couldn't go and beg. He was a little too weak uh, to go and dig ditches, and so he was like, what am I going to do? And so he comes up with a plan. He goes and he calls together all these people that were under his, um, under his control, on his book, as it were, under his, uh, un under his um, uh, dealings, and he called them all together. And what I think he did, and what I think Jesus is trying to say, is that he got rid of that amount that he was overcharging, maybe even dropped his commission off of it. The master would get what the master was supposed to get, but maybe he would earn favor in the eyes of these people as the books got squared away and got right before he was actually fired. So that's what he did. His, his process was simple. Use resources to gain me fu future for the <laughs> favor for the future. This not only helped him in the eyes of the customers, uh, but the owner took note of this and said, finally, you're kind of getting the point here that uh, how you, what you charge people and how you interact with people in regards to finances will have an impact on your life. It'll have an impact on your life in a business sense, but it's also, as Jesus then points out, going to have an impact on your life in a spiritual and eternal sense as well. There's another character that's not part of the, of the parable, but that is in the passage that I want to point out. You probably noticed it. It's not Jesus. Of course, he's there, but it's the people that uh, Jesus is talking to and the people that are around him. Uh, one of these groups that are around him is known as the Pharisees. These are these super religious guys. Um, they dressed the part. They looked religious in the first century. You would tell right away if you were at a store, if a Pharisee walked in, because you could see them. Uh, they, they looked like a Pharisee. They thought they were righteous. They thought they were better than everybody else. And they were the people that were in power. Along with their hunger for power, they were money hungry. This propelled them to sneer or scoff at Jesus' teaching on money. And if you look here in the story, you will see in the story that they should have seen themselves as the servant before he changed or before he was fired or before he came to his senses. They should have seen that that was them, but they did not. I don't think they realized that Jesus was talking specifically about them. And so I wonder, did they know it at all? I guess it's hard to tell exactly what they knew uh, from the text, but it, it seems to me that they didn't. But to be fair to them, it's easy to miss truth when we don't believe it's truth, isn't it? When somebody tells you something that is true, if you don't think that what they're saying is true, you're not going to bring it in and incorporate it into your life. And so it's hard to see truth when 
and that that truth should impact you if you don't really believe it to be true at all, if you hold a different value system. There's a story in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. You should go back and read a little bit later. Those of you who have read 2 Samuel might be familiar with it. David is the king of Israel at that point, And he sends out his military and they're all out fighting battles. And he falls in love with the gal that's bathing naked on a roof next to him. And calls her into his palace. And they have a great night together. And she becomes pregnant. So then David goes and has the, um, the military commanders make sure that her husband is killed in battle. So that he could be honored as a hero. And that David then could get what he wanted. Which is this woman into his, um, into his palace. And also protection from having some bad publicity about what he had done. And so God isn't happy with this, so he sends a prophet named Nathan to go and talk to David. If you're familiar with the story, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you haven't read it, you should. They should make a movie out of it. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty interesting what's going on there in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And so Nathan comes, and the way that he addresses David on this issue is he doesn't go right at him. He kind of goes around it. And so he tells a story about, uh, to David, being the king, about a guy who had this little lamb, this cute little lamb, and he used to sleep with it in his bed, you know, he, he like petted it and kissed it and hugged it and called it George, you know, I mean, this is like this great little, this great little lamb that he had, it's like the only one that he had, he was a poor guy, and this was it, like a family member, and then his neighbor was a really rich dude that had lots of sheep, he had lots of money, and he had a friend come to stay, and he didn't really care about this friend enough to use one of his own animals for food. So he went and he stole this guy's one little lamb and served it up. And David gets all mad and it's like, we should hang the guy, kill him, you know, like, what are we gonna destroy him? And Nathan looks at him and says, you are that man because of what you did. Now, you know, this, this guy had one wife, you have many, you're the rich guy, you're the powerful guy, and, you, and he couldn't see that Nathan was talking about him until he went right at it. And that's what Jesus does here. He kind of goes right at them at the end. And he goes right at them and says, you should be understanding the fact that you are not looking at money correctly, you Pharisees. So as I read all that, and as I kind of took that all into consideration, I went, yeah, I can't believe those Pharisees can't see that Jesus was talking right to them. And then God was like, and I can't believe you don't see that I'm talking to you, <laughs> right? It's easy for us to miss the ourselves in the teachings of Jesus and maybe in this one. Sure, I'm sure you're not overcharging people and taking extra at all. I mean, I'm not saying that, that you are exactly like this individual here or that you're exactly like the Pharisees, but I do think we could all benefit from understanding that we need to refocus our commitment to our finances and renew our conviction that tomorrow matters in regards to what we do with our finances today. That how we live with our resources today has an impact not only on our tomorrow and not only others tomorrow, but then on how God interacts with us into the future. So let's look at the point of the passage and not get lost in all the details now that we understand what was going on. Let's look at the overarching point of the passage and here it is. How we treat others with our money today will have an impact on our tomorrow. How we treat others or each other or those people that we run into out there with our money today will have an impact on our tomorrow. Yeah, how we treat others with our money affects multiple things in the future, but Jesus only points out two of them here in this telling of the story. And so that's going to be our focus, these two things. Uh, please, I urge you to write these down. Uh, they're not going to be on the screen. Uh, I'm just going to tell them to you. I'll repeat them a few times so you get it. Uh, first... Jesus points out that our spiritual responsibilities in the future will be impacted by how we handle our money today. Our spiritual responsibilities. When we view our money typically, and um, when we talk about our money typically, typically with other people, and when our culture talks about it, money is the biggest issue of life. 
It's easy to feel that way and to think about it this way because not only does our culture view it that way, but we feel that in our lives often because money either stops us from doing things or allows us to do others or, you know, maybe there's this lustful thing or this greedy thing that we always want more and more. And so money is very powerful and so we feel like it's the biggest issue in life. However, look at the text here. Notice Jesus says that it is a small thing and that it is not true riches. It is a small thing. Money is a small thing and it's not true riches. Possessing worldly wealth might make you rich in the eyes of others. But if we want to be truly wealthy in God's eyes and do great spiritual transactions in the future, we have to handle this funny money that we are playing with, that we are allowed to play with well. Our money is really child's play money, and we need to play it well in order to honor God. Now, my wife let me uh, sign out a couple $20 bills to bring as an example uh, with me today. <laughs> and so uh, I brought my uh, 320s. They're old and, and they're crimply, you know. It's about a tank of gas, right, folks? Maybe a tank and a half, depending on what car you have. Um, but uh, I, got, I got my paper money here. But I also brought with me money that my wife lets me have all of the time. And that is this Monopoly money that, uh, that I have here. Let me just put this down. So have you ever seen the Monopoly money? Which one's your favorite? I mean, they're very colorful, right? They're not quite as big. You know, you really can't do much with them. But this one's my favorite. Don't you want, like, tons of these when you're playing Monopoly? Like, don't you love it? And uh, so when Mia came home a few years ago, you know, we were looking for ways to just help her to understand uh, English and understand our culture and understand just stuff that she didn't have in Thailand and, and you know, things that weren't afforded to her. And so uh, we introduced her to the game of Monopoly and we wanted her to learn how to play with this stuff, you know, because then she could count and we could do it in a, you know, in a, in a way that's kind of fun. And so we would play this and she got really interested in it. And she wanted to buy every hotel, every chance she could get, you know, she wanted all, she wanted to own the whole board. And she loved it when you landed on her space and she could charge you rent. She would laugh with this like little devious laugh, you know, and then point at you and we're like, give me the money, you know. She got really, really into it. Now, uh, we know, right, like we're parents, like we know that the game doesn't translate 100% into real life, right? We know this, don't we, right? <laughs> You don't think that Monopoly is really like the real world. I mean, that's not why you play it. Like, and, and nobody in here thinks, if I win a Monopoly, I'm going to be able to win at life. Do you? You don't think that, do you? You shouldn't. <laughs> if you do, Carlisle is counseling on Tuesdays and Thursdays and would love to meet with you. It, it's just not how it goes, right? You don't think I'm a Monopoly champion so I'm going to be like awesome, you know, in this. You, you realize that this is just play money. This is just for fun. This is like trivial things. But what you don't realize is that this is trivial too. <laughs> is that this is play money as well. That this in itself doesn't make you successful at real life. <laughs> It's not like you're like, oh, I am like killing it with dollars. I am the, I am obviously like living life right. We shouldn't think that way. Now, if you're doing great with money, that's a good thing. You should want to do good in games. You know, you, I'm putting this in here. I'll leave the money up there. But this is going back in the pocket. I got to put that back later, you know. And so, like, you, you should want to do well at the game. And you should want to do well at this game. But it's, it's, just a, it's just a game part of it. It's not true riches. This money is only practice for the real world, for real responsibility that God has for us. And how we handle this play money, these dead presidents on paper, how we handle this that God has given us gives God a cue as to whether or not we'll, res we'll be responsible with the true riches he wants to entrust to us. So you've got to make a decision. I've got to make a decision. 
Do I want to just win at the game? Or do I want to play in such a way that God will give me greater responsibility in what truly matters in life? I think that's good. I'm glad Jesus said that. The second thing that we need to understand about how to treat others with money today impacts our future, our tomorrows, is that not only does it affect our spiritual responsibilities, but look at what Jesus says here. The second way is that our money uh, can make an impact on our spiritual relationship with God. Our lives are the sum, or better yet, they're the product of the choices that we make each day. The choices that I make multiply into intended and unintended consequences for me in the future, some good and some bad. Uh, the choices that I make multiply, they grow into the future. If I want something in the future, I need to do something now. If I want something tomorrow, I have to do something today. This is just how it goes. You know, we say you, you reap what you so that's right. Uh, that's one of the things we say. We also say you get what you you get what you give. What goes around <laughs> karma is not a nice lady. You know what I mean? Like these are the things that that we say. <clears throat> if we want a better tomorrow, if we want a better tomorrow, we have to choose the right ingredients of the, that life today. If you want a better tomorrow, you have to choose today to live in the way that's going to produce that life. Okay, I can't love my marriage and a mistress, right? You can't love your husband and your boyfriend that you're friends with on Facebook from high school. Those two things don't go together. You can't have both. No matter how hard you try, you are not the exception to the rule. You cannot have a great marriage and something on the side. You can't. I can't love abs and donuts at the same time. <laughs> this is a tragedy upon tragedies. You cannot consume tons of carbs and fat and allow a six pack to shine through. It will not happen. You are not the exception to the rule. This is trivial because nobody is ever buried in a half shirt. So it's not like that ultimately is going to show off anything to anybody in the end. But it is true. You can't have abs and donuts and great deal. I can't love self and others. I can't be selfish and be others oriented at the same time. It's impossible. And then look at what Jesus says here. You can't love God and money. I know you want to try because I want to try too. I know you think you can because I think I can too. But let's let Jesus speak here from, the, uh, from, from heaven. Let's let him speak here. He came here. He walked around. He knows the deal. He knows how we're created. You can't love God and love money. You can't. The two are incompatible. They do not work together. Loving money will diminish my ability to love God and to grow spiritually. Isn't it interesting here in the passage that Jesus moves from using our money to improve the lives of others in his story to talking about loving God without any hesitation at all? This is because in Jesus' worldview, in Jesus' economy, and the way that Jesus thinks about life, to love God is to love people. You can't say, I love God, but I'm selfish. You can't say, I love God and I hate people. You, you can't say, I'm following God, but I want nothing to do with the people that he has created in his image. For him... Jesus points out that loving God this way means I love you all as well. That there has to be a, a loving relationship this way for this loving relationship to work. Additionally, Jesus knows that God doesn't need your money. He's got so much bank. I mean, he has got it coming out of every way. He does not need your money. Matter of fact, he owns the entire world all of the world's money is his anyway. He is allowing us to borrow it, to use it for his purposes. We are the manager. 
He is the master. And while God doesn't need your cash, he has entrusted each of us with a certain percentage of his money so that we can choose to express his love to those who are around us by caring for them. Whatever I have and whatever you have was not given to us to hoard, but to share and to use for God's purposes in the world. And God's purposes always include people. They always do. God is crazy about people. So you who can sing, let your songs inspire others to sing towards God. You who can lead, lead others in the direction of the one who has led you out of darkness and into light. You who can teach, teach others the way, the way, the truth, and the life. And you who have money, which is just about everybody in this room and everybody watching me online, treat others well with it, knowing that what you do with your money today regarding other people has an impact on your tomorrow. Tomorrow truly matters. Live like it does. Can I just pray for us? Let me just pray. God, thank you that you care about us. You care about us enough uh, to talk to us about our resources, things that control us, things that can get us distracted from you, things that can lead us down the wrong road. And I pray, God, that you would just help us to look at our, our lives honestly, to look at our finances honestly, look at what we're doing with the resources that you have let us manage. And uh, God, I just pray that you would move us down a better path to a better future. Again, for your good, your glory, for our good, for, for our best, and uh, God, also for those in the world that you want to to use us to make an impact in their lives. Please, God, do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.